Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all, and welcome you to Drivenus. Um, boys and girls, if you haven't already lifted a sheet on the way in um, with a verse from today's Bible passage for you to scribble on and colour in, um, and maybe some of the older boys and girls, there's a, a sheet that allows you to fill in bits and pieces about the sermon. You can lift one of those at any stage um, in the first part of our, our time of worship this morning. If you're visiting with us, it's good to have you here. Um, if you're back after a while away, equally so lovely to, to see you this morning as we meet together in worship. And we continue at 10 each Sunday over the summer. Red Rock is at 11.15. And if anybody wants to go in that direction on any of the Sundays, please don't be afraid to do that. If you find yourself at a quarter to 10 going, I'm not going to get to Dravinus for 10, well then pop up to Red Rock for 11.15 um, any of the Sundays over the summer. Tied in with that, um, a couple of things by way of announcement, and I'll circulate them in the WhatsApp group later on. I'll be away the next two Sundays. So next Sunday, the 23rd, my dad is preaching and leading worship. And then on the 30th, James Murray, um, who grew up here at Dreminis, he has trained as a Free Church of Scotland minister. Um, he's living in Scotland, but he's going to be over here for, for a while um, later on in the month. And God willing, he'll be here to preach on the 30th of July. The two weeks that I'm away, Philip McClelland of Clare and Ahori will cover one week. And the Reverend Bob Allaley, um, who's retired and living in Armagh, he'll cover the second week um, through to the end of the month. But again, I leave those details in the WhatsApp group and with... Um, members of session so that if you need a minister um, in a particular crisis well then they, they'll be able to put you in touch that direction and god willing if everything goes to plan um, i'll be back here in the pulpit on the 6th of august um, and that also reminds me um, that new horizon starts that weekend and anybody um, who's up at the north coast on your holidays the week that begins 6th of july sorry 6th of august and um, new horizon is on morning and evening there are events and you're welcome to pop into any of those if you're holidaying up that direction in the second week in August. As we come to worship this morning we're going to read a psalm later on and it's a psalm that deals with the difficult topic of how wickedness seems to prevail, how people doing the wrong thing seem to get away with it and how that can feel really oppressive and difficult for those who are following Jesus. And as I think about that theme, what I need reminded of is the vision that John was given in Revelation chapter 1. Before a message is sent to the churches, and we're going to think about God's message to us as Christians in difficult times. But before we get that, John was given a picture of Jesus. And it's always in looking to Jesus that we see things properly, that we put things in their proper place. So let me read some verses from Revelation chapter 1 that turn our eyes to Jesus as we come to worship, as we live in the world, as we look to what the future will hold. Let's get this picture in our minds where John writes in Revelation 1 verse 12, I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash round his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead. And he placed his right hand on me, and he said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and hell. We're coming to worship one who is mighty who is beautiful, who is filled with grace, but he's also the righteous judge. He says he's the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, and he holds the keys. And so we come in confidence to worship him 
this morning. Before we look at the challenges we face in life and the things that burden us and hurt us, let's get our eyes fixed again on Jesus. We're going to sing together, Come People of the Risen King. Um, Our Saviour isn't dead on a cross. He's not buried on a tomb. He's raised and ascended, seated at the Father's right hand, ruling over all things. And so in confidence, we come to him. Let's stand as we sing, Come People of the Risen King. seats again together and as we pray can I encourage you uh, as I I do myself to focus our eyes um, on God as he reveals himself in his word let's not try and use our imaginations to to decide what God is like let God's word and what we've read um, inform our hearts and our minds as we talk to him let's let's come before him in prayer let's pray Lord, we still ourselves before you this morning and we thank you for the very clear picture that you reveal in your word of who you are and what you're like. And so, Lord, this morning, we do have reason to rejoice because our Saviour King sits enthroned, ruling and reigning and someday returning. Father, we humble ourselves this morning before your all-seeing gaze. You see us and our failures and shortcomings. Lord, you see the brokenness and the wickedness of your world. Your eyes are not closed 
and your ears are not deaf. Father, we come this morning and we thank you that you're a speaking God. Lord, we, we find ourselves in awe of that picture that John painted of a voice like rushing waters, speaking loudly and authoritatively, and yet at the same time, compassionately. Lord, this morning, we gather in worship, longing again through your word to hear your voice. Lord, we're reminded you're a living God. You're not distant or dead. You're awake and alive. You don't slumber or sleep. And so, Lord, we come this morning with our ears open to listen to your word. Father, we thank you that the one we worship holds the, the keys of heaven and hell because he is the living one who died and has risen and is now ascended and seated at the right hand of God the Father. Lord, this morning, help us to see that you're the king. Help us to see that through Christ's death, there is a, a road, there's a way for us back to God. And so, Lord, we come this morning humbly to confess our sin, to look again to Jesus who forgives and who rescues and who cleanses us. And Lord, we thank you that you give us the Holy Spirit who testifies to our hearts that we belong to you, that you're our Father. And so, Lord, we come to church this morning and just as we've been sick, some of us come with full, overflowing, delighting hearts. And so, Lord, help us to rejoice in you. And yet, Lord, for those of us who come this morning with empty hearts who feel broken by life who are struggling to rejoice Lord help us to turn to you again and to discover that in you there's peace and contentment and satisfaction so Lord we thank you that in these moments we're allowed even together today to transport ourselves and to find ourselves thinking again of that day when Christ will be revealed to everyone and he will rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Father, help us to live looking ahead. And as we do that, speak by your Spirit to encourage us, to spur us on. Lord, to be open before you about our failings and to seek the help of your Holy Spirit to walk in step with you. Lord, help us this morning. We thank you for your word and we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ that we stand together on the truth of the gospel. So Lord, help us this morning as we draw near to you and worship. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to read from Psalm 94. Um, there are several Psalms that carry a, a similar theme. Um, Psalm 94... You could look at Psalm 37, you could look at Psalm 73, and um, those are two you could remember, um, 37 and 73, if you want to follow a bit further this morning afterwards, and um, look up those two Psalms, they, they speak very helpfully into this issue of the wicked prospering, and then the, the big picture for us as those who belong to God. Let's read, we're going to read all of the Psalm, um, Psalm 94, it's on page 601 of our Pew Bibles. Let's hear God's word together. O Lord, the God who avenges. O God who avenges, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Pay back to the proud what they deserve. How long will the wicked, O Lord, how long will the wicked be jubilant? They pour out arrogant words. All the evildoers are full of boasting. They crush your people, O Lord. They oppress your inheritance. They slay the widow and the alien. They murder the fatherless. They say, the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob pays no heed. Take heed, you senseless ones among the people. You fools, when will you become wise? Does he who implanted the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? Does he who disciplines nations not punish? Does he who teaches man lack knowledge? The Lord knows the thoughts of man. He knows that they are futile. 
Blessed is the man that you discipline, O Lord, the man you teach from your law. You grant him relief from days of trouble till a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. Judgment will again be founded on righteousness and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? Unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said, my foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. Can a corrupt throne be allied with you? One that brings on misery by its decrees? They band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my fortress and my God the rock in whom I take refuge. He will repay them for their sins and destroy them for their wickedness. For the Lord our God will destroy them. Amen. And we thank God for his word and its truth. Now, boys and girls, come on up to the front. Um, I want to talk to you for a wee minute. Brilliant. Good to see you all, guys. Cool. All enjoying holidays so far? Yeah? Good? Excellent. Right, I want to show you a a picture this morning. Some of you might have seen this yesterday on TV, or maybe it's just the sort of thing that Sam's interested in and you're not. But you will smile, I promise you. Here comes a picture. What do you think's going on here in my funny picture? What do you think this is all about? What do you see in the picture? Animals, yeah, uh uh-huh. You know the way you get those... You do, you see a fox, you're right. And a squirrel, what other animals do you see? Yeah, there's a shark. And let me, let me take you along. On the far side there, I see a lion, maybe a lion and a bear. They're all there. They're all a giraffe. A giraffe. Right. How did you spot the giraffe? Because the story this morning is all about the giraffe. A dinosaur. A dinosaur. Yeah, they're great. They're all lined up for a race. But do you see the giraffe away over at the far side? You can see him up here. He's, he's sort of... See a bear. You see a bear. Good. They're all there. And they're all mascots at the cricket final yesterday. So yesterday was the final of the, the county 2020 cricket matches. What do you see now? I see a shark. You see the shark in the blue in the middle? Right. So, mummies and daddies, you can look up the Vitality Blast race, the mascot race yesterday and it really is a hood because here's what happens and I've you've seen them all but let me tell you a wee minute what happened in the race and you've your bracelet on, brilliant let me tell you what happened in the race because they're all lined up have ever you been in a race on sports day? yeah, a running race and you all, you all get on the line and then when the person says isn't this the way you do it? Ready, steady, go. Don't you, do, don't you run before the person says go? Isn't that how you do it? You don't. Ah, you've got to wait until the person says go. Well, yesterday, Lanky the giraffe, that's his name. He's the Lancashire mascot. Lanky the giraffe, he realized that everybody's got these, all the people in the race, they're not real animals. It's people like me with a costume on and... I wasn't in the race, no. I promise I wasn't in that race. I'd love to have been. But anyway, Lanky decided that because everybody else has got their big masks on and they can't see properly, Lanky had a clever idea. So when the man said, ready, steady, Lanky's a way off. And by the time the man says go, everybody else is way back there and Lanky got a head start and actually Lanky won the race and then all the other mascots got really cross. And there was a whole, it was only meant to be a fun race. But Lanky had cheated because he thought nobody could see. And the silly thing is, 
Thousands. You could see. Everybody on TV could see. All around the world, everybody that's watching the cricket goes, hey, wait a minute, Lanky's cheating. He's trying to get away with it. But everybody could actually see. And in the end, I think Lanky and whoever was inside the Lanky suit felt a little bit embarrassed that actually they thought they'd got away with it and then they became the, the story of the day because they cheated. Boys and girls, in the world we live in, there are lots of... Have, have you ever seen anybody try and cheat in the sports day races? Have you ever seen anybody with egg and spoon and they're holding the egg on with their hand? Yeah, I've seen it. Have you ever seen anybody, egg and spoon, they drop it, they pick up the egg, they run about four meters, stick it back on and then go again? Yeah? You seen that happen? Oh, what? <laughs> mm. I'm not so sure. I, you get a bit bigger and you'll maybe realize that somebody's brought in a, a cheat sheet to the exams and they've got all the answers written somewhere and they pull it out and they, it's not the right thing to do. Or maybe you, you look at the world and you see people in governments and wars and you go, they're not being fair. They're grabbing what belongs to somebody else. They are doing the wrong thing. And it's very tempting to go, it's not fair and nobody sees. This morning I want to tell you one thing. In fact, I'm going to run, run around here. I'm going to lift my Bible and I'm going to bring it back around here. And I'm going to go back to Psalm 94 that I read for you. And it says in Psalm 94 verse 9, are you listening? Does he who formed the eye not see? Who who, who made your eyes? God. Do you think God who made eyes that can see? Do you think God, you've got your beautiful blue eyes. Do you think God can see? Yeah, of course he can. God can see. God can hear everything. And boys and girls, this isn't just about the bad people that do bad things and think they're getting away with it. God sees everything you do and everything I do. He hears everything you say and everything I say. And even more worryingly, the Bible tells us actually that God keeps a record of everything that has ever happened. And I'm thinking, whoa, if I was a bit like Lanky in this race, and I've done the wrong thing, and I know I'm doing the wrong thing, and I'm realizing God sees everything. And do you know what that should make us do? It's the verse that comes next. People need to wise up. Do you ever think it says that in the Bible? Yeah, it does. Of course it does. This is what it says. It says, um, take heed, you senseless people, you fools. When will you wise up? You think the Bible doesn't say anything that's like that? It does. The Bible says, don't be a fool. Don't think that God doesn't see. In the end, God sees everything. And that's why, boys and girls, I know that I've done things I'm not proud of. And I know God sees everything. And I've got to come and I've got to say, Lord Jesus, I need you to forgive me. And I need you to teach me and help me to do the right thing. And even if other people all around me are doing the wrong thing, help me to do the right thing. Because God says he sees it all. Boys and girls, this morning, if there are things, and whenever I was your age, I was always saying, that's not fair, that's not fair, that's not fair, when I was at school. And maybe you see things and you go, that's not fair. Can I encourage you to pray? Because God sees and God knows. And in the end, God is perfectly fair. And he wants us to be honest with him and confess our sins when we get it wrong. But he also wants us to trust him because he sees everything. You've listened really, really well. Um, We're going to sing, Be Bold, Be Strong. Because the Lord your God is with you. There are actions. We can do those. And then after that, you can take a sweet with you. Back down. And if you've not got a sheet already, go out into the foyer and get a sheet that you can draw on, write a bit on, colour a bit in on. Okay? So we're going to sing Be Bold, Be Strong. And then you can get a sweet and a sheet. Let's stand.
Okay, uh, sweetie. Sorry, mummies and daddies can't go around the whole of church this morning. Sorry, girls, I nearly turned back. That wouldn't have been a good idea. You are welcome. I want to take a wee minute and, and pray together and pray for others. Actually, mummies and daddies, you, you can look up the, the, the 2020, the, the Vitality Blast mascot race later on, and you can see Lanky cheating and running away with the race, and you can look that one up after lunch. A couple of things to pray about. Um, we, we often pray about people who are unwell and in hospital, and maybe there's somebody you want to pray about this morning, but can I turn our attention particularly to our seniors? Um, some of the things that, that are, are challenges as we get older in life, one is loneliness, and there's maybe somebody you know and you want to pray for them in their loneliness. Maybe somebody else you know, and the frustration of limited mobility. We, we take for granted to be able to move, lift, carry, walk. When you lose those things, it is really frustrating. And then worry, which flows as well. If you're on your own, and you don't quite know where people are, when somebody will come and see you, the worries and the anxiety can lift. We read in our passage this morning about when my anxiety was great within you, you, can, you, my God, consoled me. So we want to pray very particularly. Maybe even as we pray, could you think of somebody you know who's maybe struggling in these ways and you want to pray for them within the church family this morning and, and, and lift them up before God? Please do that. We've been praying too about our summer outreach and people who have been away. Um, my Peter comes home tomorrow morning, I hope, um, they've had three weeks of camp in Philadelphia. All has gone well. At the time, sort of, we played it down. There was a mass shooting in Philadelphia in the middle of his time away there, about a mile and a half away from where they were staying. And so they, they weren't going out too far at night, as you can imagine. They've been kept safe, and God willing, and we'll see them home tomorrow. And then Lucy, Lucy Bingham, headed yesterday on her birthday of all days um, to Uganda. Has she got there safely? She's in the air as we speak. So let's pray. Um, her journey started yesterday, but she's still in the air. Let's pray for her and the various challenges as she, she goes to Uganda with the team from Down Battalion Big B. And then lastly, as we pray, uh, and because God's word tells us to do it, we're thinking this morning about the wicked and those who reject God, but God's word also tells us to pray for those who are our enemies, those who do the wrong thing. Let's plead before God for them that they would change their ways, that they would come to their senses and that God would do and bring his justice. So lots to pray about. Can I lead you? Join with me quietly as you think through these issues. Let's pray and let's do this together. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that this morning as we gather as a church family at Tremendous, it matters to you about every single one of the members of our congregation, of our families, and the various challenges that different folks face. But this morning, Lord, we want to pray for our older people. We thank you for so many saints of yours at Drumminis who have run the path before us, who have faithfully loved you and served you and witnessed to us and shown us the way towards the finishing line. And so, Lord, we, we want to pray for them this morning. We pray for those who are lonely, Lord, that family and friends would not forget them. And Lord, where we can play a role, help us to do that. Help us to come alongside. Father, we pray for those who are struggling with their mobility. Keep them safe. You tell us that you watch over our coming and our going. You will help us and steady us. Lord, I pray that where we have limited physical capacity, we would have increased heart capacity, knowing you and trusting you in the difficult moments. Lord, we pray about the worries. Worries when nighttime comes. Worries about what tomorrow holds. Lord, I pray that you would calm the fears of those whose anxiety is great within them. Lord, be their consolation and their hope. 
Help us, Father, to put feet to our prayers in how we care for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are a bit older. Lord, help us to have eyes open to see their need. Lord, we we pray for the CE team coming home from Philadelphia. We thank you for the weeks of camp that they've enjoyed and the opportunity to encourage young boys and girls in Philadelphia. Lord, we continue to pray for Grace and Peace Church, that you would enable them by the power of the Spirit to reach out into needy districts and communities and draw not only boys and girls, but their parents to Christ. We thank you, Lord, for safety and protection over these last three weeks. And Lord, we pray for Lucy in the air now. Lord, calm her fears. Give her a great sense of your presence with her. And Father, I pray that she would be encouraged to know that you have purpose in her trip. Lord, might it even be that through this trip from the Down Battalion, that when eternity comes, there would be names written in the Lamb's Book of Life because of the team that went out in July 2023. And so, Father, knowing that one day you'll bring all things together under the rule and authority of your Son, we pray today for those who are senseless and wicked. Lord, we plead that you would bring them to their senses, that they would see their need of Christ. And yet, Lord, we also pray that in the fullness of time, your justice would be seen and done. Father, we thank you that there is a big story, that all things will, in the end, come under the rule of Christ the King. And so, Lord, help us as we listen to your word, um, help, help us to be trusting and encouraged as we hear what you have to say. For it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Boys and girls, if you want to get a sheet, if you haven't already got one, please grab one. And mums and dads and all of us, let's, let's turn again to Psalm 94. I'm opening um, my Bible at that page again so that I can reference back to what we're looking at. Um, one of the, the, the God characteristics in humanity that makes us different from the birds that flew across the lawn this morning at my house um, or the animals in the field behind the lawn, the, the cows, one of the things that sets us out as unique from all of the rest of creation is the, the capacity to cry out, that's not fair. A sense, an innate sense of right and wrong and justness. And I've told you before stories from my childhood and I won't weary you with them again. And as we grow up, you, you see all sorts of wrong and injustice and things that are in some ways grossly wrong. And I, I can still remember as a child um, and a young adult seeing the, the end of General Ceausescu's reign in Romania. And you could see poverty that looked like you were somewhere in Africa. And this guy who ruled in his palace and all his money. The, the other memory actually of that era was of the, the president of the Philippines, President Marcos. Some of you will remember President Marcos and his wife Imelda. And the people were starving. The people were living in, in terrible conditions. And Imelda Marcos was famous for her hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes. And it's not just on those big scale, and we see plenty still today, the, the wealthy, wicked, who seem to be without any worries. It's not just the big stuff, it's the smaller stuff too in our lives. The, the employer who mistreats the employees, and I hope if you're in that scenario this morning, I hope that you're the employee that's being mistreated rather than the employer who's doing the mistreating. The wealthy manipulating the courts and the government to get their way. A child or a young person bullying and tormenting others in their class. And the teacher turning a blind eye because they don't really want to get in a row with that family. Or people lying their way to get things to work out for them. Now, if it was the children, I would ask you to put your hand up at this stage if you can identify with any of this. Um, I hope and pray you, you say, yes, Sam, I've seen that. Or yes, Sam, I've experienced that. And yes, Sam, it stirs and irritates and annoys me. Psalm 94 is a window into that sort of angst of heart. And I find it personally so helpful. It's realistic. It's calming. 
and then it recalibrates your heart to see things slightly differently. So here's how I want to look at it briefly this morning, just down two avenues. One is the problem of the wicked, the problem of watching godless people, and then look at the path that a child of God needs to commit to and walk along, even in the face of all sorts of wickedness around us. So let's think for a wee minute or two about the problem of wickedness. Sometimes we talk about the problem of pain and the problem of suffering. We might come to that another Sunday in the Psalms. But for this morning, let's, let's look at the problem of wickedness and then look at the path that we're called to walk as followers of Christ. Think about the problem, first of all. The psalmist doesn't hide the tough stuff. I've, I've said to you lots and lots of times as I read my Bible, I am thankful to God that the Bible doesn't airbrush out the difficult stuff. God's word speaks into the, the, the issues and situations of life that are difficult. And the psalmist does that here. A robust faith needs to look a problem like wickedness in the face. And here's what the psalmist sees. Here is his life observation of the wicked. As far as I can see, the psalmist is seeing three things about the wicked that really, really perturb him and leave him concerned about God's justice. Here's the first in verse three. Um, the wicked or the godless, the people who have no time for God, the psalmist says they're jubilant. See the verse three? How long will the wicked, O oh Lord, how long will the wicked be jubilant? The psalmist sees people who are living the wrong way, living a godless life, who have no time for God, and, and instead of them shriveled up in a corner waiting for their judgment, they're the ones who are living jubilant, who are happy, who seem to be glad in their wrongdoing. And this really irritates the psalmist. These bad guys are running around happy. Instinctively, we want the good guys to be happy and the sinful to be unhappy. And is that not the way it's meant to be? And that God, who is our saviour, brings us joy and gladness. And wouldn't you expect that those who don't know Jesus, who don't love the Lord, then surely, conversely, they should be the ones who are not happy. But you know, and I know, that the psalmist has spotted something that is frustratingly true. That the wicked are running around jubilant. Can I say to you this morning, let's hear God's word and let's reflect honestly. Many godless people or people who don't think they need God or people who are not yet Christians find a type of happiness without God. And the psalmist is really perplexed because he sees wicked people who are jubilant in their wickedness. It's not even just that they are fairly content. They're actually jubilant. It's like the, the celebration at the end of the cricket match yesterday when late, late, late at night, whatever team won, Somerset, I think it was, and they go mad. They're hugging each other, and high-fiving each other. They are celebrating. That's the picture that the psalmist paints of the wicked that really irritates them. They are jubilant in their wickedness. Peter in the New Testament writes about living in, a, in an era where people glory in their shame. Stop for a wee minute. Isn't there an echo of 2023? Think this psalm was written more than two and a half thousand years ago. And yet we live in a day where we can identify with the psalmist because people celebrate wickedness. They are jubilant in their doing the wrong thing. You see it in the increase. It's not new, but can I say to you, it's not ultimately clever. We, we maybe sit watching those who are wicked and rejoicing in their wickedness and it can be oppressive to our hearts but the psalmist sees it and he sees the big picture and he's not totally sucked in depressively he realizes it's going on he sees it but he sees a bigger picture here's the second word verse four he says they're arrogant they pour out arrogant words they're full of boasting full of boasting pours out of them. Can I put it into my language or our language? They're full of it. They're full of themselves. This sort of arrogance always presents itself in relationship with other people. It's an arrogance that thinks more of yourself and less of others. 
It's an arrogance, and the psalmist says, that crushes God's people. It oppresses them. Verse 6, they trample on the weak and the vulnerable. The things that God would cherish in terms of how we deal with people, these wicked people think, ah, people are dispensable. Trample on them. Let me get my way. People don't really matter. So the strange thing is, people who do away with the importance of God generally magnify their own importance. And when you do that, you usually then, you put yourself up, you put others down, and you climb on them. They're expendable. Treat them poorly. And the psalmist sees it, and he's vexed. It grieves his heart. Because people matter to God. And maybe you see that in the world around you. You see the arrogance of those who are wicked. And and how they treat people. And it hurts you deep. The psalmist is entering into that and identifying with it. God sees this morning. He's aware that those things are happening in his world. They're jubilant. They're arrogant. And then a third word, they're confident. Verse 7, they say, the Lord doesn't see. The God of Jacob pays no heed. I know my children's address was humorous. That Lanky the giraffe thought he could get away with it. But isn't that just a a little parable of life? The the wicked invariably think, I can get away with it. God doesn't see. There's almost a, a mocking contempt at any mention that God might hold anybody to account. I think this has become the hallmark, actually, of godlessness in our era. It's a confidence that comes with God out of the equation. I can do what I want. There might have been a previous era. Some of your fathers or forefathers would have said, well, look, Christians had a confidence. They knew who they were. They knew who God was. They knew with certainty what the rules were. And it left you confident in Christ. We now live in an age where it is an unbeliever who speaks with certainty and confidence and puts down those who have faith in God. And the psalmist finds all this perplexing. It confuses him. It frustrates him. His cry is just like our childlike cry, that it's just not right. And it's good to see that. It's good to be aware of that. It's good to have a a realistic picture of the world. But before we go on to the path that we're meant to walk, let me say one simple thing that I think is brilliant in verse 8 to 11. The psalmist in his, his wrestling with God comes to a place where he says this take heed you senseless ones among the people you fools when will you become wise does he who implanted the ear not hear does he who formed the eye not see does he who disciplines nations not punish does he who teaches man lack knowledge we may see wickedness the confident arrogant almost happy wickedness and feel like it's a problem for our faith you ever felt like that? You, you see it all and you almost feel like it's a problem for faith. I, for, I, I'm living the way that I should. I want to trust God. I want to follow him. I, I want to obey him. And yet others who dismiss him, they're living happily, arrogantly, confidently, and it seems succeeding. The problem feels like it's mine, but ours. The psalmist very wisely sees that the problem of wickedness is ultimately the wicked's problem, not mine. The Bible reminds us that in time, their wickedness is their problem. They may boast that God doesn't see, but God made eyes and he sees them. They may boast that God doesn't hear the things they say in secret, but God hears. They may think that God will not correct and discipline, but God is the one who causes the rise and fall of nations. Can he not also deal with those who reject him and cause trouble for others. Does he not hear? Does he not see? Does he not know? Of course he does. Interestingly, Psalm 94 sits among six, seven psalms from 93 to 100, which are known as the kingship psalms, the psalms that draw attention to the fact that God is king. And interestingly, Psalm 94 doesn't explicitly mention God as king, but it's the whole tenor of what it says is that, look, God is Just, God is judge. God does what is right. God is king. Take heed, you senseless ones. Can I say maybe just gently this morning to some of us who are not wicked, 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 like the the picture, almost the caricature that we have here of this arrogant, 
happy in my wickedness sort of person. I, I'm not for the life of me suggesting that there's anybody in that category here at church this morning. There's not. But to find yourself outside of Christ and saying, I don't need the gospel and I don't need salvation, God says to you this morning, come to your senses. He says, wise up. Don't find yourself caught on judgment day with those who have been arrogantly against God. Isn't that a sobering warning for some of us who sort of dither on the fence and think, well, I come to church, but I'm not sure about this gospel business. Do you want to find yourself on judgment day with those who are wicked and facing the wrath of God? I don't. So we run to Christ, even in the the trouble. How, How do we then live in the face of all of this? What does a child of God do? What does a believer do? What does the psalmist say about how we live in the face of godlessness? Very quickly, some things you can take home and I hope help you. One, praying to God for him to intervene is a good start. The psalm is laced with prayer. In verse one, um, the psalmist says to God, shine forth. What is he saying? He's saying, God, shine your light. Um, Be the torchlight that shines in and exposes the darkness. He's saying, God, rise up. What's the picture? It's the judge rising up in the court to pass fair judgment. He's saying, pay back. In other words, settle the debts, straighten things out, make sure that justice is done. And he cries out and says, Lord, how long? God, don't let this go on forever. Do something about it. God invites us to talk to him about everything, including the tough stuff. I love Psalm 62 where we're told to pour out our hearts to him from the depth of our innermost frustrations to come to God. Psalm 73, please go home and read it later, really explores this theme. Um, The psalmist just wrestles with how the wicked seem to prosper. And then in verse 17 he says, it all just seemed impossibly wrong until I entered the sanctuary. In other words, until I came to the place where I prayed. Until the moment where I realized God is in this God is in control and it changed my perspective and it's okay to pray for the downfall of the unrepentant wicked yes we pray for repentance and restoration but the Psalms are full of cries for God to avenge that's the word that comes in this Psalm not revenge in a a human sense where out of our irritation with people we lash out and we get our revenge no God's vengeance is his righteous judgment, his setting things straight. It's God being God. And so maybe today, there's something that you want to take to God later on, and you want to pray personally about something that has been wrong, a wickedness that has been done against you. Can I encourage you to take that to God? Don't let it stew. Sit down and deliberately say, Lord, this has happened. God, I know that you see, and I'm bringing it to you. Or maybe in the bigger picture, of the world that we live in and some of the grotesque injustices against humanity in war, in the trafficking of people, in poverty. Lord, I know that you see and these things matter to you and I'm crying out to you about these things. Turn to God with the angst in our trouble. Pray like the psalmist. Here's the second one. Embrace God's personal discipline of your life and heart. It says in verse 12, Blessed is the man you discipline. Just pick up again. Blessed is contented, happy in a spiritual sense. So the psalmist is saying, he knows there are those who are jubilant or happy in their wickedness. But he's saying, no, no, my happiness, my contentedness is in a different place. It's in the discipline that belongs to a child of God. Hebrews 13 speaks of the Lord disciplining those that he accepts as sons. So every day is a school day for a child of God. Part of the proof that you're a child of the Father is that through his word, he corrects and disciplines you. Um, I have memories of childhood, and I'm sure I've done the same to my own, and I won't pick out instances. But I can remember in my childhood, in among a bunch of boys at church, up to probably mischief that we shouldn't have been at, and I was slightly miffed when my dad walked in and said, don't be at that, Sam. And I'm looking at Rodney, Gavin, Willis, Johnny, all my mates. Dad didn't say a word to them. He said, don't don't be at that, Sam. Why? 
because the other boys weren't his children. Now, he didn't think what they were up to was very good, but he had jurisdiction over me. I was his child. And part of the evidence that I was his child is that he exercised discipline over me. It was part of his loving, protecting, leading care of his child. And isn't it interesting that the first thing that the psalmist says about himself in the psalm, in the context of a psalm about the wicked, the first thing that he is saying is, God, I'm learning. I'm, I'm a child of your discipline. Against this backdrop of wickedness, Lord, teach me your law. And do you know what I think? I think the psalmist is saying, look, I know I'm not perfect either. I'm living against a backdrop of wickedness. Lord, I want to see and learn why your way is best, even though I'm frustrated by all that I see around me. Lord, I want to learn to trust, even when it seems like today things aren't right and things aren't fair. Lord, I genuinely want to trust that in time you will show your justice. Lord, I want to grow in godliness rather than drift into a path of wickedness or sourness. It's one thing to, to, to see wrong and be frustrated by it. It's very, very easy to drift into a spirit of just so annoyed that you become bitter and sour. And I think the psalmist is saying, Lord, I see what the world around me is like and I want to learn. I want to accept your discipline. I want to learn to trust you even when things aren't all that they should be. And so thirdly, he focuses on the promises of God for now and the future. Just look quickly as we move to a close. Verse 13, 14, and 15. Verse 13, he says, listen, Lord, you grant him, or the, the righteous man, relief from days of trouble. Relief. It's respite or relief. You, you, you know what that is in, in terms of, we, we use those words, we get relief from the sunshine when you go into the shade. Um, some of you who farm get a relief milker. It means you get a break from the draining daily grind of having to do it every day. There, there's a, a moment of relief or respite when somebody goes into care and, and there is relief and respite. The, the, the psalmist is saying, Lord, in the midst of the heat of all the wrong that I see in the world, you're the one who gives relief from the days of trouble. The Lord only tests us up to what we can endure. Verse 14, you won't reject your faithful people. We belong to God. He has made promises that he will keep us. He said, I won't reject my people. Verse 15, there will be justice and judgment based on righteousness. That day will come, so live in light of it. In my praying, I can pour out my soul and my frustration and my hurt. But when I open up God's word and hear his promises, for now and the future, then I know I've got somewhere to stand. One of the, the, the sad realities for Christians is when we stop reading God's promises, when we stop opening our Bible and hearing what God has to say, then we begin to believe that maybe the outcome isn't secure. It's in opening our Bibles and saying, Lord, I know that your promise is good, and in time you will set all things straight. If I don't read God's promises, if I don't remember God's promises, I flounder. And the psalmist finishes with this. He's reminded that there's someone who is standing with him and for him in the tide of wickedness. This spoke to me this week. Verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against the evildoers? Unless the Lord had given me help, I would have dwelt in the silence of death. Who will rise up and stand for me against the wicked? Isn't it madly discouraging when it seems like everyone is just not caring in the face of wrongdoing? Oh, it's just the way it is. There's nothing we can do about it. Just the way it's always been. There's nothing you can do. Just turn a blind eye. The psalmist couldn't cope with it being like that. And he said, who is going to take my part? Who's going to stand with me? in the face of all that is wrong. Who will rise? And he gives answer to his own question. The Lord helped me. For 17, I'd have given up if it wasn't for his help and his love. My anxiety about it all was so great that I would have no hope but for him who held me 
and gave his consolation to me. Verse 19, he supported me and brought me joy. Again, isn't it interesting? Joy. He said, look, the, the, the wicked seem jubilant, but I have a joy that is different in seeing the big picture. He is my fortress. He is my rock of refuge. He is my hiding place. Let me finish with this. Because I'm needing personally to hear it this morning as I trust you are too. Christ is my advocate in the face of wickedness in two ways. He is my advocate because of my own wickedness. It's all very well to read a psalm like this and go, that's about them, but it's not about me. The psalmist who had experienced the mercy of God realized that he too was wicked. He too could rejoice in doing the wrong thing. He too could be arrogant. He too could be confident that God doesn't see. And the psalmist knew that one had risen and stood for him. One who intercedes. In the gospel, that's our only consolation. That in the face of our sin, one has stood and gone to the cross and taken the blame for us. It's about my wickedness before it's about other people. But I also need to hear this morning that Christ stands with me and beside me in the day of wickedness. I love the story of David and Goliath, and we sometimes oversimplify it for the children. But David stood in the strength of the Lord for the honor of God's name, and God vindicated himself. Maybe this morning, there's a, a, a fresh need for you to come again and say, Lord, thank you that one stood for me when I was the one who was wicked. And we come again confessing sin and realizing God sees everything. Lord, thank you that there was one who stood for me. And then to remember in the trouble that you face and in the seeming wickedness getting away with it, God, I thank you that you stand with me in this world onto a day when all things will be made right. We need to get our eyes fixed on that day to live well in this day. So whatever you go home to, whatever is the thing that is burningly annoying you about the wicked world, take it to God in prayer. Embrace the discipline as a child and say, Lord, I know that you see and in time you'll make all things right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the wisdom of the Psalms and I thank you, Lord, that they point us time and time again to a saviour king who has made us right by faith and who calls us to stand firm in all the storms of life. Lord, help us today where there really have been things that have broken us and irritated us and, and just feel so grossly wrong. Help us to bring them to you. And like the Psalms, to find peace through the king and his just rule. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to finish as we sing together before the throne of God above.
Father, we thank you that our lives are hidden with Christ in God. We are anchored to you and to our heavenly home place and to that new day that yet lies ahead. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to sail on into the wind, into the breeze, well aware that we stand facing against the tide of the era in which we live. But Lord, help us to do that, knowing that our advocate, our saviour friend, has stood for us and stands with us. And we pray now that the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit would be ours today and forevermore. Amen. Just as you, you take your seats and head, I'm going to, Jim's already heading to the door. Jim, would you shake hands with people on the way out? Because I'm going to have to run to Red Rock and give Jim a job um, and you'll have somebody to say hello to on your way through um, as I make a run for Red Rock.